Ah, sorry, my audio, yeah. That was, oh, yep, that was it. Sorry about that, my audio. I hope you can hear now. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, so this gives completely independent interactions. There's just one type of it, just for fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I keep forgetting to change that after the talk. I've seen it, but I forget to change it. Okay, so this is impressive. So, what about bosons? I mean, for bosons, it's very different, right? I mean, they can all be piled up into the, to the ground state. In fact, they kind of prefer to be piled up into the ground state. So, you can't really do anything like this. Um, but can you use the fundamental properties of bosons to kind of get constraints? And not anywhere like fermions can you, but it turns out that there are fundamental properties of bosons which can help you constrain things. That, that's, that's basically what I'm, where I'm going. However, before we get there, um, there, is a low, there is a strong lower bound which comes on the mass of bosons. And that is um, basically in these ultralight boson ultralight uh, boson dark matter, they form some kind of, this is supposed to be some kind of boson sign condensate. <laughs> I made this picture, but anyway, that's supposed to be a boson sign condensate. And if uh, the, the size of the particle is effectively one over its mass. And so these particles, as they get very, very light, they get very, very, very large. And they can't be larger than the galaxy or really these, these dwarf galaxy sizes, because if it's larger than that, you wouldn't have a dark matter density that cuts off at the size of the galaxy like you see. It would actually cut off at some much larger distance. And so you shouldn't see dwarf galaxies of this 10 kiloparsecs because uh, the dark matter can't be com um, compressed into some size smaller than that. So effectively, this gives a strong lower bound of like 10 to minus 20. So it really is larger than that because there are other bounds they can do to push that bound up. But this is really a fundamental property of the particles really putting a strong lower bound because it's related to the Broglie wavelength, which is some fundamental property. So uh, they're actually related to small scale structure, lime alpha and stuff. And basically by, uh, I can't remember exactly what is the issue, but basically it comes down to lime alpha force and looking at these small scale structures. It doesn't work with these large size particles. Aren't their bounds even much stronger than 10 to the minus 24? Yeah. So, so it really, it's more like 10 to the minus 22, 21, and even some current things are saying 10 to the minus 19, but there is still some debate on what is in, and so this is ultra, ultra conservative. Yeah, it's probably more like 10 to the minus 20 or something. That's true. Does it assume that scattering length of this dark matter size is larger than the size of the galaxy? So what do you mean? Does that mean these lower bounds, is that what they're doing? If, if, they, if they scatter one on another, they don't. Yeah, they're ultra, ultra, they're ultra there's weakly there's interacting. No interaction. no interaction means that scattering length is larger. 
mean free path. Uh, yeah. Ah, I see. If you're saying mean free path, well, but there's gravitational interactions. That's what we're not doing. The gravitational interaction should be strong enough to contain it within the galaxy. Yeah, that, that, gives, the kind of that gives us some something, but that, that has to be, but again, if the wavelength's too large, it still becomes difficult to, you know, kind of put You assume there is no other escaping mechanism, but gravity. Yeah, so at least gravity, yeah. Okay, so there are bounds, and, and even one of them is somewhat, but it has nothing to do with being a boson, okay. Okay, so why are bosons special, okay? The reason bosons are special is because you can pile up a lot of them, you know, on your vacuum state, right? Um, so this is just, you know, some, some box phase, and you, you pile up N of these. Um, <clears throat> so what, what does this do if I take, let's say now I have, a, I have a dark matter and it fills up some state. So normally when I calculate, let's, I'm just going to do decay, so I'm going to discuss why decays don't actually work for some kind of bosons enhancement. But normally we consider a scattering from, you know, one particle on the vacuum, which then decays to two particles on the vacuum. This is the kind of thing we consider. But actually if you have a background of all of these particles, for example, I just do some nice thing, then I have to consider a scattering from some n plus one state to uh, two different n plus one states, right? So I would no longer be considering this, I would be considering something like this, okay? Um, this gives an enhancement because when I operate by a state, I get a square root of nk plus one. So there'd be some enhancement by the k into this background that is not there for empty space, okay? This would lead to some kind of matrix element, which would be have enhancements for each occupation number of each kind of particle. So, this is dark matter particles, so, what, what? so I'm thinking about, so this is not, I'm not yet to dark matter. So this is just quantum field theory, basically. I'm just talking about a decay of some particles in the background. Um, of, of a boson. Yes, of a boson. Yes. So uh, eventually, I'm going to start talking about what kind of decays could you do with dark matter. But here, I'm not quite really there. When I get there, maybe it'll be more clear. This should be this indistinguishable particles. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh -huh. So, so they have to have the same momentum, same state, same everything. Yes. Correct. Uh -huh. So they have to be indistinguishable. So, so the point being is that in, in, the, area, in the universe, right, so the, the gravitational well of the universe creates some bound state of these particles effectively. And they're effectively at the, you know, very low energy, very low momentum. So they pile up in more or less the same momentum state. And in some sense are a quasi-coherent state. They're not quite a both einstein state. They're kind of in this in-between range, but they're, they're quasi-coherent. And so, you, so that means they're all piled up in mostly the same state, but there's some. But, but some then you want them to scatter, right? Or, or, or yeah. So if you want to detect them, you need the scatter or something. Yeah, exactly. Scatter each other. So, so I'm not actually going to consider scattering with each other, but that's one thing I'm going to discuss. But no, no, not not scatter with each other. Sorry, scatter with some other particle. So, ah, so people do look at them scattering with each other because there is, you know, self interaction can help explain some of the features in, you know, looking at galaxies and whatever. But I, I'm not discussing anything related to that. So, where this enhancement comes from? So, um, <coughs> if I if this process happens in a vacuum, you know, these are kind of thinking about some. I know this is not quite exactly right, but I want to. Explain something. There's no only one state for it to decay into. It can basically decay in one state. But if there are multiple particles, there's multiple ways it can be incorporated into the vacuum. So in some sense, think about path integral method. I can uh, combine it in different ways to form the final state, and that gives me effectively seven paths. If there's seven particles, there's seven paths in which I can incorporate it, and I get an enhancement of seven. So this enhancement comes in some sense from increasing the amount of ways to decay. Um, just on stuff you discuss, right? Yeah, so, it, yeah, so I'm, I'm just trying to give an intuitive way of thinking about this. So if you look at this, it ends up getting, you know, from this, if you do the normalization, you find you an n plus one half k. It comes because you have to normalize the states. And then this is more or less what he's saying. If I take a particle and add two together, I would, you know, symmetrize it. It's a boson. If they're identical particles, then they can be written as this. And, and then I get a square root of two. So that's where you can get the square root of two coming from. 
Okay. So uh, what, this is what I'm going to mainly talk about. And again, normally when we do propagation, we do propagation from vacuum to vacuum. Okay. But if you have a background, your propagator is no longer a vacuum to vacuum propagator, but an end state to end state propagation. Okay. This means your propagator is going to be modified by this background. So with no background, we, we, we calculate with these AA daggers between the vacuum. You can actually create some commutator like this. Uh, because when when you switch the order, they, they annihilate the vacuum, and this gives some contribution, you know, proportional to delta function of momentum, etc. However, if you do this in a background, this piece doesn't actually cancel. In fact, it gives you some contribution, and that contribution is proportional to the occupation number of the state. So effectively, I have an additional contribution, and if this occupation number is high, it can be a very large contribution. So. This is effectively what you would get for the propagator. So it's, K, it's this delta function, which actually implies that this is an on, on shell propagation, which it must be because it has to in some sense incorporate itself into the background. Um, and this is almost identical, to, it is identical to real time formalism of finite temperature filter. The difference is you can derive this without ever stating what this is like. So it doesn't have to be some Bose or Fermi distribution or something. It, it just relies on the properties of the Raisin and Loin operators. So if the propagation can be enhanced, potentially everything has the potential to be enhanced, right? Because um, any process that you're already calculating can have a loop. The question is, will it be enhanced enough that you care about it? That's, that's a different question. And that's what we're going to try and address. So, uh, uh, but, but uh, may I ask you, uh, you know, uh, it implies that it is uh, the state uh, you're considering this large number of boson is coherent state, right? Um, technically, it doesn't need to be coherent. I need, I do need some some particles within the same state, but I could have. No, no, no. Just a moment. Uh, 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 it could be uh, differences that it could be individual particles. It could be many of them, but they would be not inter inter interfering because they have phases, and if phases are different, uh, then there is no interference. And uh, uh, the difference is that if it uh, whether it's large number of particle uh, or it is like a wave. Uh, this large amplitude, it's not the same. So that's what I'm asking. So, because what you are uh, implying, it is like a wave. It could be the case, uh, like I say, a laser wave or whatever. Uh, uh, then, then you can uh, imply it. But, but it could be just large number of particles, which are then when you are uh, averaging uh, interference disappear, and then there is no any enhancement. If the if the particles are every single particle is in a completely different state, then I agree you probably don't get some kind of enhancement. But if I have blocks of particles in states, the states have occupation number more than one, I can I can integrate over all those contributions. That's like when you do in finite temperature. Oh no, 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 right. But, that, but then you're implying that it is like kind of a uh, large amplitude. Uh, uh, of these bosonic states are present. Uh, then I would agree, with, but I'm not sure in the real, you know, dark matter whether it's in the coherent state or it is kind of a uh, large number of particles, but is which are not coherent. So, so uh, most research, most people believe that it is quasi coherent, meaning you have a large number of particles in a few amount of states, basically. So they're not all in the same state, but they're piled up in large bins of similar things. And that has to do with the fact that you start up, so most, most production mechanisms are some like misalignment mechanism, which means they all start out in some coherent oscillation. And then the gravitational interaction decoherence them, but the gravitational interaction can only decoherence them in a certain way. And so it leads to a little bit of decoherence, but they still are effectively kind of an oscillating particle, which is effectively in the same thing, but there is some decoherence. So that means that you have large part number of particles in a few number of states, in which case mm -hmm. like, this should work. And it should work, this, it does work. And uh, as you'll see in my calculation, it actually doesn't care that they're in slightly different states. So as long as there's several bins with lots of different particles in it, you can actually add them all up because they all contribute the same amount. Anyway, 
if you consider say example when you have a gas of this dark matter particle then it would be no co coherence right no, i mean uh, take extreme extreme limit where when they are far kind of uh, a distance so so it should uh, i mean in principle could be different regime in certain regime it could be coherence and certain regime it could be no coherence yeah, i just do not know enough about this dark dark matter state to to be sure what what we are talking about and just expressing uh, some doubts that it could be uh i mean generically it could be uh less incoherent states and uh, you still you, you see that uh, you are operating uh, certainly in the in the assumptions that they are coherent right when you're calculating this so you need to realize i'm talking about ultralight dark matter the occupation yeah. number is insanely high i mean there's crazy amounts of dark matter particles here. okay okay so so then it means that you already have kind of condensates indeed because you uh, believe that uh, in, i mean the temperature provides for you something uh, like an analog of a normal condensate right yes, uh, so that... I'm, yeah yeah especially thinking like axion or uh even yeah. a dark i actually going to talk about a dark photon but again dark photon they think in this ultralight regime is effectively like some coherence scalar. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, and this I got, yeah, so that uh, in this way, this assumption that it is like a coherent state, like a condensate, then of course I would agree, but but uh, but uh, just, uh, I'm not sure whether, you know, kind of it's justifiable assumption, but but it's okay. Yeah, I'm it's, it, it, what is it, Mark? That's the regime that you talk about the axion that, you're starting out with some non-zero initial value for the field, and once you get to a certain point, that begins to evolve, and you get these oscillations, coherent oscillations of the scale. I see. So your I starting see. point is coherence, and then there are some gravitational effects that can break up that coherence a little. No, bit. no, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Is that if it's kind of the history was that they were produced in kind of from the same source, then coherence is is much better established. I, I think this slide is the non-coherent part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, yeah. So this may be confusing. I'm just saying why you can't do it other ways. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is not, I don't believe in you know, this kind of thing, you can't do this. Yes, exactly. So you can't actually thermally produce this, right? It's, the dark matter is so light. So I'm I'm thinking what I can constrain is roughly less than 10 to minus 15 EV. So that's in the range I can constrain. So this is very, very light. So the CMB is 10 to minus 3 EV. So you can't produce this thermally anyway. I mean, it, 10 to minus 3 is so much larger than 10 to minus 15 that it would be relativistic and, and it, it wouldn't work. It would be hot, hot, dark matter, and it doesn't work. So you can't actually produce it this way. And there's lots of other reasons you can, I mean, how do you produce this, whatever, I don't care. It's obvious that this is impossible because it's relativistic. Okay, so you can't do that. So I'm also, just I'm going to be discussing um, Dark photons here, just because that's what I what I constrain, um, and it's less well known, I think. This up anyway. There there is a paper uh, by these people where they show that you can do the same thing, a kind of misalignment mechanism with uh, dark photons. Um, the difference here is that they think of the longitudinal mode uh, as um, the derivative of some scalar, and then you go through and do the same thing with a um, bunch of Davies vacuum and how it, it excites this uh, derivative of this. And then basically they show that you get some power spectrum similar to you get for a scalar field, just in this case you get time to momentum. Um, and in doing this, they show that you can create a vector dark matter, um, uh, which, is, which is all of the cold dark matter uh, for pretty high inflation and actually still pretty large um, Dark matter. So I can't really constrain this, but the reason I'm mentioning this, because actually this is relevant later, because if I take 10 to minus 20 EV for this mechanism, it produces 10 to minus 7 percent of dark matter. But actually, for dark photons, I can still constrain, even if it's this small fraction of dark matter. So uh, this mechanism, which in some sense automatically produces this dark photon dark matter if you have a dark photon, um, can still be constrained. So there's another model by these people. And this is a terrible model. And that's not what I say. That's what they say. Okay. Um, basically, they say they just made this model to prove that it's possible. That's no other reason than prove it's possible. So what they do is they couple the impliton to this dark photon. And then they then during inflation, again, it, the impliton fluctuates out the uh, 
dark photon field. However, the problem is this generates curvature, uh, isocurvature perturbations. So then you have to add an iso, uh, uh, a curvaton, right? You have to add a curvaton in order to get the curvature and so forth. So it, it is a terrible model, but it shows that really this dark matter is viable in that sense. And they, they make some figures, as you see, they can easily go down to below 10 to minus 20. Uh, and they can have, you know, lots of different radiant temperatures and uh, different inflation scales and so forth. So it, it is viable. That, that's all I wanted to say there. Okay, so now this is a bit about uh, which, which kind of dark matter you have. So, um, <laughs> meaning which longitudinal, you have longitudinal component or transverse component. And it turns out <coughs> the gravitational interaction actually can change the spin of the photon. And so no, independent of which state you start out with, this, this, honestly, I can't remember what these values correspond to, but they basically correspond to different initial constituents of either transverse or longitudinal. Anyway, in the end, you end up with one third, one third, one third. Um, this is two thirds because there's two transverse moles, so they count as the same. But anyway, you end up with the same amount. So it leads to an equal partition of spins through this gravitational interactions, no matter what you start with. Okay, so um, so now I, I want to here I want to explain why the Ks are not a good way to look for this. Okay, because this is actually what we originally what I originally started looking at and realized quickly that well actually not as quickly as we should have but anyway pretty quickly we realized there's an issue. So um, <clears throat> so for decays, I think about fermionic decays, right? So it's a decay to a boson. Okay. So this this requires some kind of flavor changing interaction. So with a standard model, you know, there's not a lot of flavor changing decays like this which are allowed. I mean, maybe you could come up with something and it might be enhanced, but again, it, it's it's a necessity in order for that. Um, if you want to decay from a boson, so a boson is a standard model, this would require the Higgs, that's the only boson we know of, and it would have to decay to two dark matter particles. This has several issues. One, it would be hard to keep it light. Second, kinematically, this is not allowed because it can only enhance the decays to the states of the background. The background is very ultra non relativistic. So, unless you know this and this are very similar in mass, that would work. This is very heavy, so it'd be hard to have lots of particles. So, again, it doesn't work. Another issue is actually kinematics make it difficult. It's hard to because this has to be so ultra low energy, <coughs> you basically need this particle like super relativistic to work. This is if it's a dark matter mass of like 10 to minus 15. So in order for the kinematics to work out, you need to boost this. Effectively, you need to boost the, the dark matter needs to be going, or the decaying particle needs to go so, so fast so that the background particles, which are kind of stationary, now look like they're, when they're decaying, they're relativistic, right? So you can meet kinematic constraints. So again, it's very difficult. Two body decays. So then you might think, what about three body decays? Because kinematically, I can then easily fit this. I mean, effectively, it's just like this Z, for example, came to two electrons plus some small energy there. That might be your first thought. But actually, that's also problematic. Because this is so low energy, this propagator is effectively on shelf. So there's effectively an IR divergence going on right here. This is basically Bremsstrom, right? Yeah, Bremsstrom like things going on. Um, so, so you have to worry about it. And it turns out, um, <coughs> oh, I thought it more. It turns out that if you do that calculation, which I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit more detail, the very particular calculation, which is done by someone else, not me, it kind of cancels. But the point being is you now have to start thinking about how the IR, IR divergences come in, even with this background, right? You know, and in a background, IR divergences are actually stronger. Let's, I, I, this is all about thermal backgrounds, okay? So this is about a thermal background. And, um, uh, the like the occupation number of a thermal background is one over Q, so it's one over the momentum. So in very low momentum, um, I get an extra divergent contribution. Okay, like in the wave function normal. It, uh, uh, what I mean by extra, I mean power is the logarithm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. If you add more, how you can regularize the relativity? It's like such problem, right? So. So you, you could try resumming. So actually, I, I actually calculated this, 
But as long as you consider all contributions, you can actually calculate it, even though there's not a divergence. But it turns out that the linear contribution cancels. Okay. So another way you could try and do that, as what you're saying, is resummation. And uh, I did not try that, but I assume it has to be similar, right? Like so what? Like so yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't do that kind of technique, but I assume it has to be the same thing, right? Because and let me, and I'll show you. There's another calculation not done by me where they do it, and they actually show how all the IR divergences cancel. Right. But anyway, <laughs> give me a minute, and then if you still have a question, we can we can talk more. Did you only think about these for like a Yukawa interaction, or was it beyond like interaction? A you mean like a derivative yeah. interaction? Yeah. So, so this is one thing I didn't consider, but I think it's a moot point now. So this is one thing that I, after the fact, realized basically what you're saying. So. Pseudoscalers have don't have IR divergences, right? So I think that's your point. Pseudoscalers don't have IR divergences associated with them. So you could think about this being a pseudoscalar, and then the IR divergences go away, and maybe you have an enhancement. So I don't know the answer to that question, but it's possible because it shouldn't have an IR divergence. Um, but 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 my constraints that I have now are so much stronger than I think I can get from this that it doesn't really matter. Okay, so effectively, so they're uh, Donahue and Holstein, they calculated this calculus, this right here, where gamma is a some thermal back. They have some thermal background back. Okay. And basically, this, this is straight from their papers. We effectively have to calculate all these contributions if you want to know um, um, what the contribution is. So this is like Renshaw. So this, this is the uh, you know, tree level decay. And then this is the one correction and, and the cross term, the cross term of these two vertices. So, the, so this is M zero B and these contributions are order alpha are of the same order as these contributions, which are just absorption and emission of some photon in the background. Okay. And now the sum of those should have no IR divergences, right? Okay, so yeah, again, Donahue and Holstein in 1983, they calculate this. And they found that order T cubed, they found no correction to this decay. Okay? And that actually surprised them. They expected a correction in order T squared. And I'm going to tell you why they what, what this T temperature. Sorry. So this is this is the final temperature field theory. So they're doing in a thermal bath in the background, and T is the temperature. So they expected a correction in order T squared over Me squared, and it canceled. Okay? And that's a very interesting question. Uh, is this photon in the phase of transparency? It's, uh, it's massless. It does not acquire some kind of mass, right? No. Yeah, so, so yeah, so here it's, it's massless, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so it's a photon. So photons do, yeah, this is basically Brenstrom, some decay with some Brenstrom associated with it. Mm -hmm. So they calculate this contribution and, and they, they do an expansion in K because they're looking at the IR divergence behavior of this. So and these pieces right here, remember the, the, Bose, the Bose distribution has a one over K divergence and low K momentum. So this is a one over K squared and you integrate that as divergence. This is one over K um, uh, from this. And so it should be divergence. But this right here, this K piece um, should be you know, finite in some sense, right? No IR divergences at this point. So they expected a contribution of order this. Um, uh, effectively, because this piece right here, you know, gives you some, gives an, when you integrate to get gamma, right? You get something like this, which is k to the zero. So it's effectively just of order k and not IR divergence. However, for some reason, it just completely cancels. And um, for background fields, you kind of get a similar thing. You have to worry about these same things. That's all I wanted to say there. You have to kind of worry about similar things. So, but this is a statement. This is directly from their paper. It says, this vanishing appears to be accidental, but we have also calculated the radiative correction for the decay of a pseudoscalar H instead of scalar and found that to be zero also. So for some reason, the IR divergences conspire and this leading contribution cancels. Now, what you said is different and may, I actually think may be okay. And that's effectively you switch these two, right? Make a Z boson and then the decaying particle is a pseudoscalar. I think actually that may give an enhancement. Um, and maybe there is some way to make some constraint like that, but I kind of think it not anymore after the constraints I can put. 
it's worth maybe looking at them. Oh. So um, they later did, and this is where I'm going, they later did uh, G minus two. And G minus two, they found actually had a P squared over MD contribution. Um, this is still too small for, um, for experiments, um, but there is a T squared contribution. Okay, so now uh, we're going to look at the propagators. Look at these propagators, uh, how the propagator comes in, and that's we're going to look at G minus two. Okay, um, but how do you realize where are you going to get the most bang for your buck? Meaning, where are you going to get the best results where this gets the most enhancement and can give you the best sensitivity to dark matter? So um, I'm just telling you this. You're going to have to believe it, but effectively the enhancement comes in some form like this. Um, it's the rho dark matter divided by the dark matter mass squared, and then it has the mass of the particle in the loop squared also. So dark matter coming instead of your gamma? Yeah, so what I'm really going to do, yeah, so uh, let me, maybe the next slide. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to calculate these diagrams, and this is going to be a dark photon with a background. And so I'm going to look at the contribution from this enhanced propagation, um, in these loops. So this is a dark photon, this is a photon. And so I'll look at how that adjusts G minus two by the alteration of the propagation in the background. And this dark photon, does it have a mass? Yes, it has a mass. And that will be a finite temperature. And well, so, so, so it's not finite temperature, it's more like a uh, finite, uh, more like a chemical potential. You have some background set of fields. So effect, effectively, you have a non-trivial occupation number, but it's not thermal. So you have some, some distribution, but it's not a thermal distribution. OK, so to get the most enhancement, you get some enhancement like this. And so the thing that gets the most enhancement will have a light mass in the loop with it. And, um, and, and you also want precision measurements. Um, make it more sensitive. So this will actually lead to G minus two being a good a good way for this. Um, so I'm gonna and this is more or less a proof of concept of how this can actually lead to new important constraints. And I'm gonna focus on ultralight dark photon. And effectively, ah, there's a typo here again. I, I, there should be a chi here. So I'm thinking of chi chi e. So this this interaction is chi e with the dark photon with an electron, for example. It's the coupling strength is chi, which is the dark photon mixing. And and then time b. Okay. So that's the coupling. So to be clear, you're working in the space just where a and a prime are mass eigenstates. Like yes. There's no a prime coupling. Yes. Uh -huh. But then they both have some coupling to electron. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So my my plan is to do g minus two. So g minus two. Actually, there's just a recent experiment, 2020, end of 2022 even improved the G minus two measurement. Um, the error is of order 10 to minus 12 now, something like this. So it's very precisely measured. So the electron, right? Yeah, electron. Yes. Okay, and, and then I'm, so I'm, gonna, I'm basically gonna calculate these diagrams and I'm gonna give you some details, but I don't necessarily expect you to follow them. They're kind of technical. But then I'm gonna show you, and again, this is a bit technical, but this is the kind of convince you I'm right. I'm gonna show that charge is not renormalized. So even though there's this background and I calculate this, I don't get some charge renormalization. And I'm going to show the ward identities are satisfied. So effectively, you still kind of have uh, gig invariance. Okay. And then I'm going to also discuss and show that the final result in the, in the limit mass goes to zero doesn't have IR divergences. So it uh, should be okay. Also. The dark matter is, is which here? Dark photon. So this, photon. Yeah, the propagating particle. And not, not the decaying particle. Yeah, so this is no longer decaying. I'm thinking G minus two now. Okay. So so this is a particle coming in and scattering off uh, some photon but, background. But the other photon is regular, is regular photon. So this is regular photon, this is a dark photon. Okay. And previously where you had MI squared and dark matter squared. Yeah, so MI is the mass of this particle, and then this is M. So you want this particle right here in the loop to be as small as possible. So that's an electron is a good candidate since it's the lightest other than neutrinos. Neutrinos is a bit difficult because 
doesn't directly couple the photon like things. But if you could find something that really had just, yeah, but then the Z mass is in there. So then you have to worry about. <coughs> so anyway, there might be a way of neutrinos. I haven't gone through this part very well, but, but if you could do neutrinos, this would even be a larger enhancement. So here you're going to assume <coughs> that there's a background of dark photons, but yes. not of normal photons. Well, there could be a normal photons, but I'm not really worrying about them. I mean, there's a C and B or whatever, but it, sh it, it, it has a smaller effect, as actually shown by Holmstein and uh, well, Donnie Gunnell. So, so my concern is that I think there's a shielding effect here. So for yeah. instance, if there's like a shield around your apparatus. Right, so, so, so two things. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. So two things, G minus two experiments aren't perfectly shielded, right? They have to, because they have to have a um, quadrophil, quadrophil, electric quadrophiles, right? So it's not a perfect shielding, one. Two, there is a bit of decoherence in this, right? And that decoherence means that there are not all the states are completely being generating this electric field which can be shielded, right? Because you have, naively, let's say you had, I had half the states, you know, with an oscillation like this and half of them like this, right? That's not what you have, but I'm trying to take an extreme case. This would completely cancel the electric field and then you couldn't get any shielding kind of effect, right? Because this would lead to this would lead to a equals zero, right? <coughs> so in this case, you have two bins: one bin with dark photons coherent this way, one with them coherent that way. So I created two bins and I put them right on top of each other. The net a is then zero, and so then you have no electric field generated because your a field is zero, right? And then effectively, is, is this, are you talking about the dark bin? <coughs> No, so I, I'm taking an extreme example. This is not reality. But the point being is if you look at really what happens with the dark photon, there's a paper, Amin, I'm trying to think who the, all the people are. I, I remember Jane, Amin, anyway. So what they show is that there is a little bit of decoherence. The, 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 the dark photon field is not completely coherent. So instead of just going like this, you know, some oscillation like this, you have an oscillation in the amplitude. Right, the amplitude oscillates, and that's because over time they're decoherencing a bit, which means that the electric field from every single particle, the, the A field from every single particle, some of them decoherent, you know, decoherent, they kill each other. And so you have um, some cancellations among the fields so that you don't actually generate an electric field. For, for example, think of a thermal bath, right? In a thermal bath, this calculation has been done, and you don't have an electric field from a thermal bath, right? Yeah, but in this case, the decoherence I think happens on an insanely large scale. It's like it depends on the scale of just g minus two of the experiment, it should be pretty coherent. Um, yeah, well, no, it's time. It's, it's current decoherence or in really time. Like it's not in space, so it's decoherence in time. As long as, and the point is, the experiment measures over very long periods of time, and so they should be able to. Anyway. Anyway, it doesn't matter if it can see this coherence. The matter is whether the state is completely coherent or not, right? If it's completely coherent, then it should cancel out all the electric fields in some sense. But not by, not, well, it doesn't cancel it out. It will generate a corresponding standard model electric field, right? That's, that's what you're saying. It will generate a corresponding standard model electric field, which could, should cancel out the effect. I assume that's what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's the case. And, I, I think there's because of the decoherence and also the experiment can't completely lock it out. The experiment, like I said, is a quadrophile field. And so it's actually can't lock it out anyway. Well, so the, the thing is like the, the experiment itself is not the only thing that shields sure. you, right? Like there's like the room and, and even like even outer space itself is actually. Well, you can also worry about the ionosphere. So if you're worried yeah. about the ionosphere, actually the ionosphere actually can't lock it out. The frequencies we're looking at, the ionosphere has holes in it also. Yeah, yeah, but even outside the ionosphere, like the, like interplanetary space is. But but is again, also I, I mean, okay, I mean maybe I haven't considered interplanetary shielding or whatever. But again, it has to be complete. That's my point. If it's even if it's a small effect, I will still have a huge constraint. I mean, even if it's order one effect, I can still get a constraint. So I agree that there probably is some shielding in what you're saying, and it's order one. Okay. Um, and that's fine. I, I, I still can get a very strong constraint. I don't think it's order one. I think it's order like the size of, say, if it's the interplanetary atmosphere, like interplanetary space that's doing it, then it's like the size of the cavity in interplanetary space over the wavelength of the dark matter. Which can but be but you're saying, no, because I mean, you're saying that 
you're saying that it's a perfect a perfect cavity and therefore should perfectly shield it out on that scale. That's that's not true. It's not a perfect cavity. Even the ionosphere is not a perfect cavity, right? I mean, so so, so the ionosphere has holes in it uh, if because the the magnetic field. So the magnetic field of Earth generates pierces holes in the ionosphere. And these holes will allow penetration of of, uh, of dark of anything electromagnetic radiation effectively in low free in very low frequency range. So I, I don't know about the interplanetary thing. We can maybe discuss it, but I imagine it's not perfect either. I mean, there's magnetic fields in space and so forth. So I, I don't know. We can maybe have I mean, it doesn't need to. I don't think it needs to be perfect. Like the, the point I was going to make is, if you like, you're you're working on the basis where they're mass eigenstates. Mm -hmm. right? There's another basis where they're not mass eigenstates, but the yeah, and photon is uh, interacts with stuff, and the dark photon doesn't. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're surrounded by any sort of conductor, or plasma, anything that like is interacting, mm -hmm. you're going to kill off the interacting part, and you're only going to be left with the sterile part. So in that basis, it's entirely dark photon. But then in the basis that you're working in, I think that means it should be mostly dark photon with a little bit of normal photon. And so I think that means when you do this calculation, really mm -hmm. with these propagators, you should be doing doing like one diagram where this propagator is a dark photon, but then also one propagator where it's a photon, and you have some background for the photon. So, but but uh, so I I yeah so I agree with that, but my assumption is that is a subdominant contribution because, um, yeah, so it has a larger coupling, but I'm assuming it's a much smaller component, and I'm assuming I guess what effectively what I'm assuming is. That it's order one differences between the pieces I'm considering. But, but I you're think trying the, to say the ratio of the couplings is exactly yeah, 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 the I ratio understand. of the occupation. But, 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 but again, I'm only looking for an order of magnitude estimate. Just for example, what is the ratio of the couplings just to be this was exactly my question. How small is the coupling of the dark photon to the electron? So oh so this is a thing I had a little bit of a typo in when I, I just had it, but it's it's basically this. You have it's this with a chi e. So how how big is it? Yeah. So, um, so I will consider as small as ten to the minus seventeen for this. I, I can constrain okay. it. Ten to the minus seventeen. Yeah. So the kinetic makes it. Now yeah. I have a question. How mm -hmm. this thing is thermalized? It's so small, right? It's not thermalized. Ah, it's not thermalized. But this was that. Yes, yeah, so it's not thermalized. It's just some ah. background there. Even though, of course, not thermalized. It is massive, so it's moving through this. So yeah, it's, it's very possible. slow. It's very, very slow, non relativistic. It's not really Yes, yeah, like and the, the electron is really Yes. Ah, uh, no. But is it faster than, than your. So, well. For the dark photon. Oh, sorry? Your electron. Uh -huh. Is it faster than your dark, integral dark photon? Or it's slower. Or it's actually it's slower than the uh, electron. Is so it depends on the experiment you look at. So some experiments. It's like this. So it depends on the experiment, but in the experiment, some experiments it's faster, some it's slower. It depends on the experiment. In the one, in the most recent one, it's slower. But if it's faster, it should sort of change the value of your dark photon. So you're saying, well, so the point is you can you have to calculate I calculate in the basis of the background, right? But it should, in some sense, be independent. There is Lorentz violation, which I assume is what you're getting at. I assume, right? Because the speed of change of you, 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 you move faster than photon, you, you, you radiate the photon. Right, but but again, that's that's Schoenkopf radiation. I thought the idea of Schoenkopf radiation was that as as you take an electron, it's moving faster in the medium than the speed of light in that medium. Then what happens is the molecules within the, in the material they are they're vibrating or whatever as the molecule goes by, and the response time is slower, and so it leads to some. And the radiation is absorbed and emitted effectively, and that slows down the radiation. So, because the particle is moving faster than the light can move in that medium, oh no, not sugar. Are you talking about sugar? I'm talking about. But if you move in a medium faster than the typical speed in this medium, yeah, but the, you will radiate. But the, but the point so is. Boom. But the point is, the, the particles aren't moving at that speed because that's the speed in the medium. They're moving that speed because that's how much energy you have. They're massive. It's not like light, right? Light has is always traveling as fast as it can, right? 
And but a massive particle is not. You can accelerate, you can slow it down, whatever. This, this particle is not going that speed because of medium force, it's going that fast because of how much energy it has. Look, Sony boom, take take an airplane traveling uh -huh. faster than the speed of sure. the sound. So the speed of sound is exactly the same as the speed of particles in your media. Uh -huh. You know, after square root of three. Sure. Uh, so if there is interruption between your airplane and and, and air, you will have a sonic boom, right? Which is a change of radiation. But again, okay, keep on. I'm not sure I can. Yes, that, 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 that. If, yes. You, if you move through the media and you move faster than the typical particles in this media, you you are there. Yeah, but it's not the typical speed of the particle. It's the allowed speed of the particle. So that's my point. Is right. so air air has air based on density, pressure, whatever. There's lots of certain properties of air, and based on that. There's a set velocity of the wave in the medium, right? And that velocity is set by the medium and everything. No, it's just thermal velocity. Yeah, but it's set by the properties of the medium, right? That's just temperature. Yeah, fine, whatever, just temperature. Yeah. But that's fine. It's set by the properties of some property of the medium. And it's that no matter what. But for a dark photon, that now that velocity has nothing to do with anything around it. I can speed up that velocity, I can slow it down. It's not based on the properties of things around it. It's based on how much energy it has. It's not completely non-interacting, and its velocity is completely determined by how much energy it has. Because if it's on a boom, you need the interaction between the particle and the medium. Mm. Yes, but he has. But he has yeah, but it's so weak. It's, it's so weak it can't generate anything like that. Very, 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 very. So, so it's so weak that that, that effect is, with no way would have mm -hmm. This is very tiny effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, I think this is very, very tiny. But I, I mean, your, your point is you should create a sonic boom in the dark photons, right? You're, that's yeah. in some sense you're saying. Yeah. yeah, I think that interaction is far too weak. I don't know. I, I haven't thought about it, but I'm assuming it's far too weak. All the particles which interact with these guys should eventually lose energy and, and thermalize with your dark photons. Sorry, did you answer the first part? So, if, if somebody is moving faster, Mm -hmm. In media, then it loses energy because of this. If it, it might, might, take, it might take a long time, though. yeah, it might take a long time, but you know, it's time of the universe. Well, but the point is, the experiments, experiments only operate on yeah, it's the time of the experiment, right? The point is, you have these electrons that in the experiment, and that's what you want to look at, and they, and they only operate for ordered days. And, and in days, I it only I don't I don't think it would lose that much energy. So, so over the course of the universe, that's true. You, you yeah, galaxy, and Why won't it talk to them like that? Well, it, so yeah, its interaction is so weak that it, like even, so it does decoherence, okay, a bit. <coughs> Being it's originally you had a complete co or coherent state. Which then interacts gravitationally, that ends up being the dominant interaction, and that then leads to some some decoherence or some thermalization or whatever you want to call it, some changing of the state. But again, that time frame is very long, also like millions, probably billions of years, millions or billions of years. Probably billions. Sorry? Better be billions. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so basically I calculate these, I calculate these diagrams, effectively like, uh, so I first calculate the wave function normalization, and uh, you get uh, some Lorentz violating piece. Anyway, this makes it a little bit challenging to calculate because you get this Lorentz violating piece right here. Um, so you can't, because normally when you do this calculation, you just get a mass term and then a wave function normalization and everything looks like it, Conserves. Anyway, you get this piece, which makes it a little difficult. Um, effectively, you then have to worry about spinners that satisfy this whole equation with conditional contributions. This is kind of like what you do with wave functions with mass renormalization, right? The, the spinners satisfy the renormalized mass relationships. But in this case, you have to include some Lorentz violating contribution to this spinner relationship. Anyway, and so then you can calculate this contribution and it gives something like this in terms of these functions that I have made. Um, 
Anyway, and this is the counter terms. So then you also have to worry about wave function normalization. So to get wave function normalization, you effectively compare just the typical propagator of some uh, Fermi uh, fermion propagator equation to psi psi bar um, when these things satisfy relationships like this, which is the typical relationships. Um, and you do that and you find you get some background dependent wave function or normalization, which is again important for canceling IR divergences and so forth. Um, if you do that, you get this total contribution looks like this. This is in terms of these functions I had before. And then you have an extra little piece here. <coughs> this solely comes from this. Anyway, this is just trying to go through this quickly. It's just details. Um, so then you can check charge renormalization. This is take delta k equals zero. And then you take the mu equals zero point. Because the background breaks Lorentz invariance, you really have to look at the mu equals zero piece to look at charge renormalization. Um, and if you do that, you find that uh, you get IE, the charge, just like you would expect in charge in renormalization. You can then look at the ward identities, look at the ward identities. And um, again, this is just details, it's not really that important, but you basically can show that to order delta KQ, which is the momentum of the photon, uh, it's correct. And I only keep terms up to delta K which one times by delta k mu for the ward identity is gives me delta k squared. So to order delta k squared, everything is conserved, so it should be okay. This is my final answer. Um, I'm kind of uh, taking a long time. So anyway, so you can see all these pieces are IR, IR, uh, IR finite. So this R is proportional to the dark matter mass squared. So if I take the dark matter mass squared to zero, <clears throat> I'm left over with only pieces which are IR convergent, such as this. And the IR divergence pieces have mass squares, so there's no IR divergences there. So, that's of sum, the, the UV diabetes does not exist because of the temperature, right? The, yeah, exactly. So, well, in this case, it's not temperature, but it's the background, right? The background doesn't allow for yeah, any right. momentum larger yeah, than yeah, some very low value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Anyway, so I take a, a constant magnetic field, I then put this in the Dirac equation and solve. And uh, I only get two kinds of contributions. Anyway, this is just some numbers that aren't that important. But you get corrections to a spin frequency and uh, cyclotron frequency. So this makes it a little difficult because you get cyclotron frequency corrections from the background. You can't just directly compare to G minus two. So you actually have to compare to what they measure. Um, <laughs> So from that, you can read off your cyclotron frequency and you can read off your uh, spin frequency. And what they measure is spin frequency minus cyclotron frequency over cyclotron frequency. You can then do some expansion. This is this RF where they measure and you can do an expansion. The dominant contribution to RF is delta omega over omega A zero because omega A zero is basically proportional to alpha over two pi. So effectively that gives a little bit of enhancement in this, correct, this contribution to RF, makes it more sensitive. So, <clears throat> so then I estimate the number of the dark matter occupation number. I do a really terrible estimate, but I take the dark matter mass over, or the dark matter density over the dark matter mass, and I take a one third, assuming some equal partition of states. Um, but if I want occupation number, I need to turn it into uh, particles per two pi cubed, right, effectively. So I divide by the volume divided by two pi cubed to get it into the right occupation number. Anyway, so then I do a really terrible integral. I don't really integrate it. I just cancel out <laughs> units and get some numbers. So again, I'm doing very rough stuff I, I, because I don't really know this distribution. I could use some estimates, but I'm just, I, I don't care that much. So anyway, uh, so then I get some, some estimated correction to this from, from uh, theory. So then I can, from this guy's thesis, uh, I can get the errors from omega C and omega A. You see omega C is larger. So that allows me to estimate the experimental error on the delta RF in terms of experimental errors. And I, I, I do a little bit larger than what they say just to be conservative. Um, so then I can take, compare these two, theory and experiment. Theory must be smaller. I get some relationship like this. And then this is my final result. <coughs> um, so this is previous constraints right here. Um, uh, this is mostly from spheroidal galaxy cooling or something. Um, 
And my new constraints are here, and you see they're almost 13 orders of magnitude larger. And actually, in terms of actual contribution to uh, g minus 2, because this is actually a square root of the contribution, which leads to this constraint. So actually, there's actually 26 orders of magnitude larger contribution than, uh, than is allowed, since you're going to coupling squared. So it's a huge contribution. Um, future experiments should be able to push this limit up a little bit. This, this line right here, um, this line right here is for omega a or omega c is 10 to the minus 10. Because it goes to the square root, you still get quite a strong constraint, even if it's a tiny, tiny percent of dark matter. Um, you can do a similar thing for axions. Um, so for axions, um, you basically do the same thing. You do some kind of estimate. Actually, this value is maybe updated a little bit, but anyway. Um, Anyway, you get some similar constraints and you can rule out some new, new, new parts of the axion parameter space up to about 10 to the minus 16. Well, they're a little bit weaker than this. Some part of the experiment, I didn't quite, I didn't quite understand. I just, just talked to the guy. So anyway, this will be a little bit weaker, but this is the general idea. Um, my student is currently working on this, this, this coupling. So this, this allows you to constrain this coupling because this is the axion photon uh, coupling plus the uh, axion electron coupling. You do the same thing for G minus two. And this leads to new constraints, uh, but it depends on both couplings. So you can't really disentangle them. But anyway, for given values, you do find that there's new constraints uh, on these couplings and they can be consistent with the misalignment mechanism. Anyway, so, there, so there's lots of ways and these are you know big, big new constraints on these couplings. So <clears throat> that's, that's my talk. So basically the idea is that this Bose enhancement to the propagation um, leads to uh, new huge effects and new contributions to things like G minus two, which are, and if they're precisely measured, then you can lead to new constraints on ultralight dark matter. And, and the thing that I think is interesting about this is it's based on the Bose property of these particles, which um, is kind of looking at the fundamental features of particles and seeing how they can help us constrain. As you see, because I looked at axion and dark photons, I don't particularly care which one. I'm just interested in this effect. So thank you. If I understand um, a little bit following up with your previous discussion, if you're doing a G minus two experiment, mm -hmm. you would expect them and the stuff, there is this coupling and there is this uh, field then your result for the, in the G minus two experiment is going to depend in principle on where you do the experiment, that is depending on what the background of the, you're in. Yeah, point. I mean, if there's, yeah, the dark matter background, yeah. yeah. So if it's large enough, so something I didn't discuss, but it's true. So there is an IR cutoff here. So some people have asked me, can you do this? Like actually when I was in, in Vietnam, they asked me, well, why can't I just do this for a photon cavity and have lots of photons in there? And why wouldn't I get in and you to see this and this kind of thing? But there's an IR divergence here, or there's an IR cutoff here, actually from the electron mass. <clears throat> and so the true enhancement actually from the occupation number actually goes as M, well, M dark matter to the fourth. This is actually the occupation number is more like something like this. But your enhancement is actually only And it's effective because you're getting an, an IR cutoff from this of the of M dark matter squared over M, M electron squared in this case. And so, um, so you actually need a lot of particles in there to overcome this, this huge IR cutoff here, actually. Um, so, you, so if you were to do it in a cavity, I think that cutoff would be like T squared over ME squared. So kind of the energy of the photons over the, uh, this is the, the dark photon. No, well, I'm saying this is if you did even for a photon. You can maybe think about trying to create some cavity background and look for this effect in a cavity. Right. And this would then be a real photon. And then the energy of a photon, because then the photon would act as the background in this case. Right. And so then it would be the energy of the photon divided by the mass of the electron. But again, this is a huge cutoff still, even if you have EV scale photons or something. So you would need a cavity with MEV. If you, if you really want to look for this, yeah, I think so. Okay. So that, that's difficult, right? So, so if so, you did the experiment in the sun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So 
when, when people talk about kinetic mixing, usually they say that if you, if you take the mass to zero, any effects of the dark photon have to go away because you can always just diagonalize mm -hmm. the things, right? But somehow your constraints get even stronger as we take the mass to zero. That's for the occupation number. But you're, you're talking about a non trivial, you're talking about a zero background. You're saying there's no background, and then I take it to zero. The problem is, the problem is, is that I fix rho dark matter to be some constant, and then I take this to zero. So my occupation number goes to infinity as one over the mass of the dark matter to the fourth. Yeah, but I mean, all, all these other bounds that you were drawing, they also, you could say the same thing about that, that like, as, as they take the, the mass to zero, their amplitudes of the dark photon are going up. But like, yeah, but, still die off. Um, but like, like you're saying that as, as the mass goes to zero, the occupation number increases. And I agree with that, but that's true of every dark photon probe. All the other like plots, all the other bounds you were showing, that's also true. So yeah, where, but where does Kai come into these estimates? In uh, so Kai, well, Kai, right, you have so Kai is strictly right here, it's a coupling here and here. Yeah, I know, but in your uh, ah, so Kai. Yeah, see, so it's, it's right here. Yeah. But I think that that's the point. If you send i to zero, this goes away. I was saying send m to zero, the mass of the. So, of the but the point is, is that you have these dark photons already in the background, right? You have the dark photons. So when you send chi to zero, or send, or what you're saying, send the mass, mass to zero. zero. Um, yeah, so, so, so I, I think the point you're getting at is, is that performing the rotation, you have to be a little careful about performing this rotation because you have dark photons actually sitting yeah, there. Like when you rotate, then you also have to rotate the, the state that they're in. But then th this comes back to my earlier question is I, I think the point is really about what is the state that the dark photons sit around in, in, in the galaxy? Uh -huh. are, they, are they in this like sterile state or are, in, are they in the mass lighting state? And I claim that they're really sitting around in a sterile state. So why are you why do you think they're sitting around in a sterile state? Because they're constantly. Well, but again, again, by the way, it doesn't matter. I'm not interacting with the background, because that's what you're trying to say. I don't interact with the any background at all. Well, your your electron is interacting with the dark but sometimes. No, not at all. Or, I mean, like it's showing up in your propagator. It's showing my propagator, but it never interacts with them. You emit a particle and you reabsorb it. The electron emits a dark photon and then interacts with it. It has nothing to do with the, the background, right? It doesn't interact with the background. It's enhanced because there are now additional paths for it to take. It has nothing to do with the interaction, interaction with the background. It has to do with it. there are additional paths because there's this background. Sure, that's fine. I guess I'm just saying in your basis, in your language, there's also a background of normal photons, not just of these dark photons. And I think that's what you're missing. So I, I understand what you're saying. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So if there is a, is a non-trivial factor, I don't think that matters. What, why are you thinking that matters? That's what I don't understand. Because I think these contributions exactly cancel out. Like if you, you did the same diagram with a photon running. Oh, because your, your, your point is you're saying that there is there is no interaction. But then you're saying there's no interaction, total no interaction. And you're saying that because you think it's screened. You think the field screened. That's ultimately why you're saying that. Uh, yeah, I guess that's. that's but I don't. I don't agree with that statement because you're saying it's perfect shielding. I, I don't agree with that. I mean, this is my point. So if 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 I had a completely random, completely non coherent let's say let's say I had I had ten waves like this that had a had a phase like this in space, and I had ten waves that had something like this. Okay. If I sum up those those waves, the total A field is zero, right? But I don't have zero particles there. I have 10 in this state and 10 in that state. If I then propagate through that state, I will still get an enhancement of 10 from this and 10 from that. But the electric field of that is zero because the A fields cancel each other. So that's the point. The decoherence leads to no electric fields, but you still have particles. I'm not interacting with electric fields. I'm using the fact that there are particles occupying state. And there is some decoherence, and it's order one decoherence. So, do you think this this would be screened? This state, 
You're, you're, saying, you're, you're saying these are 10, 10, 10, 10 photons. I have 10 photons. photons like this and 10 uh -huh. photons like this. Would that lead to because that those they're canceled? They're amplified. It's like a decoherent wave. They completely cancel, and there's no A field, right? There's no A field, and so so there's no way you could screen that because it doesn't generate an electric field. So you're claiming that that would still lead to a correction? Yes, the because there's ten in this state and ten in that state. When I propagate through it, there's ten here and there's ten there. All I, I'm not actually interacting with the background, I'm propagating through a background. And so <laughs> when I incorporate it into this state, I get 10. When I incorporate it into this state, I get 10. So there's now an additional 20 something ways to propagate through the, through the background, even though there's no electric field. I guess the thing that's showing up in your, your calculation is, is N, which is like the amplitude squared of the. Of the dark, of the like of the background, right? Well, no, it's just it's just in, it's just in. Occupation number, it's not occupation number squared. Because, uh, well, effectively, when you operate one time on the background, you get squared event, right? And then if you operate twice, you get n squared. So the propagator is operating twice, so it's n. Yeah, but, but does n go like the amplitude or the amplitude squared of the? Um, oh, I think n goes as amplitude, amplitude squared. I think of where, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, then it seems like, yeah, they should have, these wouldn't cancel out. Um, so, yeah, if you're measuring, actually measuring electric field, these would cancel. But if you're actually measuring this enhancement from propagating through them, it shouldn't cancel because there's a, there, because the point is the, the electron generates a field that's consistent with this and then it reabsorbs it. It generates a field that's consistent with this and it reabsorbs it. Those are all new paths. And so there's order one decoherence in the field, right? There's order one decoherence. So that means that there's something not like this, but there's a whole bunch that are coherent and then a whole bunch with then a, a non-trivial fraction which are a little bit off. And then you can propagate through those states or the extra states that aren't being canceled by what you're talking about. So there is an order one I think there is an order one cancellation, like to, from what you're saying. I agree with that. But uh, which, but I didn't go into the details, and I haven't looked at this details. So I agree there's an order one cancellation. But again, you can see these constraints. An order one cancellation is not going to be much. We can maybe discuss after. Mm -hmm.